Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Clean Machine Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. This video is for educational and informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. SOS. I'm sure some of you have heard that expression. Um, some of you may not. SOS refers to uh, dietary considerations to limit or eliminate salt, oil, and sugar. Okay, let's dive into this because, so I was listening to a podcast of one of the plant-based doctors uh, yesterday or just a couple days ago, and uh, the doctor was pridefully saying, oh, uh, one of the followers said, I'm following your diet 80%. And his response was, you're not following my diet because no one does my diet 80%. You either do it 100% or you're not doing it at all. And you know that, that's, well, it concerns me. It, it concerns me because I think we can get so strict and dogmatic in trying to, and look, I, I believe the intentions are sincere. Uh, you know, following his protocol 100%, I think will we'll get you far better results. But can't we make room for people to <laughs> make some choices that maybe not are perfect, but at least they're moving in the right direction and applaud them and support them all the way until they can adjust to dietary changes and make them a part of the habit, make them part of the healthy lifestyle. That That's where, that's where my intentions are. You know, that's why... I developed a, a product line to help people who are looking to stepping stone. Hey, look, if you can live in nature, you know, com, you know, completely free of toxins and uh, pick from your own garden where things are wildly grown on beautifully rich, nutrient dense soil with all the microbes in it and everything. Well, that's awesome. That's what I want for everybody to get back to the garden, right? Um, but that's not the reality for, for the vast majority of people living in first world countries. We have packaged foods, we have foods that are grown far away, even in different sides of the planet and shipped here and processed and all kinds of stuff. And I think making some choices that are the best choices that we can make given within the parameters that aren't going to put us in an awkward position with friends, family, challenging positions. Look, back in 1985, March 15th, when I became vegan, I didn't even know there was a word vegan, but I knew I was going to commit to it because I just didn't want to hurt animals anymore. And, and it was extraordinarily challenging, but I was coming from such a grounded, heart-centered space. I knew I just wasn't going to do that, period. No, how, no matter how difficult it was, uh, to do it. And and I struggled mightily for the first couple of years trying to find foods that were enjoyable and, and prepare them in a way that I could enjoy them and stuff like that. It was challenging. It's so much easier now. There's so many other foods. The difference is there's a lot more packaged and processed foods. And that makes it more challenging for the health, easier to make the change to a plant-based diet, harder to make the change make it comfortable, make it work, make it socially acceptable and enjoyable and still keep it healthy. And that's where the challenges come in. Okay, so let's get something straight right from the beginning. Salt, oil, sugar. Okay, salt, aka sodium, sodium chloride, to be, to be honest, it's two molecules stuck together, but sodium is the big culprit here. Sodium, sugar, aka glucose, and oil, aka fats, are required for human health and survival. So I think when sometimes in social media, we oversimplify and overgeneralize things to the point without really saying what the exact truth is. And we come across to people who may not be as educated, may not be as aware, uh, may not be as informed on certain things. We just say no salt, no oil, no sugar. Okay. Well, then they can pick up uh, a, a stick of celery and say, oh, it's got high sodium in it. I can't eat the celery. And I'm like, 
no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Or, you know, I don't eat fruit because it's high in sugar. I don't know how many times I've heard that. And no, my God, don't avoid these good foods because of this, you know, fear that unfortunately has been propagated. <gasps> Salt, oil, sugar, bad, bad, bad. Don't touch them. Don't take anything with them in it. And that, that's simply not the case. Sodium is required for the human physiology. It's the sodium ions are what and sodium pumps are our, our body is dependent on. Okay, let's back up a little bit. And, and sugar is the foundational molecule for energy for every cell in our body. Actually, almost every cell in the entire biology of all cells feed basically on sugar and most predominantly on sugar, glucose. And, and I'm going to get to that in a second. I'm going to break each one of these down. But let's let's get where this comes from. Okay, so we have three uh, requirements on our tongue, which is basically uh, sugar, salt, and fat. Why does our tongue register positively to our brain when we hit sugar, salt, and fat? Okay, first, sugar. Why sugars? Well, nature and then plants have gone out of their way to make things that are very healthy for us, high in polyphenols, high in antioxidants, high in fiber, high in good sugars, sugars that will metabolize and that our body can use for energy. Nature went out and made those called fruits, mostly sweet, so that we would be attracted to eating This is a symbiotic relationship we carry on with the plants. The plants make their fruits smell good, smell sweet, taste sweet, and brightly colored so that we can see them from a distance to attract us to go grab their fruit eat the fruit, and then throw their seed down and scatter the seed. That's a symbiotic relationship. They help us by giving us nutrition and energy, uh, antioxidants to protect our cells, and we help them by redistributing their seed. Beautiful relationship. That's a win-win. That's why sweetness is there, to attract us to the things that will be good for our bodies. Salt. Why salt? Salt is required. So we love salty tasting foods because our body requires it. Our entire uh, muscle contraction system. So muscle health depends on it for contraction and relaxation. Uh, our nervous system, our entire nervous system is based on sodium ions. Sodium's all lined up along our, our things and it flips positive negative and that's how a nerve function works. Without sodium, we fail, we die. <laughs> Same with sugars. Without sugars, eventually it will catch up to us to the point of death. Same with fats. It's there, that's why this group of fats called essential fatty acids are essential to life. So sugar, salt, and fat. Uh, fat is also high in calories. Now our body is programmed to like the taste of fats because it means, hey, we're getting even more, almost two and a half times as much calories than uh, protein or carbohydrates or sugars. So our body says, well, great, that's good for survival. So our body has this immediate satisfaction and satiation symbol tied to fats. So fats are necessary for our health and our body then is attracted to them. Now, food scientists figured this out. Hey, these are the three things we need sugar for energy. We need salt for nervous system and muscular function and, and water balance. And we need um, the essential fatty acids for overall health, brain health, heart health, uh, joint health, all of it requires that. So they figured this out that we have them tied to our tongues, our taste buds, and said, well, wait a minute. These are primary functions that human beings and many other animals have based right on their tongue. If we just go out and make the foods high in sodium, high in fat, and high in sugar, people will be drawn to wanting to eat more of them and they'll consume more of our products. So that was a marketing play done by the food scientists to get people to buy and consume more of their products extraordinarily successful. We got people by doing those three things, hiking up the sugar, hiking up the fat, and hyping up the salt, 
we got people to eat lots more to the point where 66% of our population is now considered overweight or obese. Actually, even half of the people under age 35 even are now programmed to that function of eating these processed foods with this added sugar, added salt, added fat, to the point where we are hypertensive from the salt, diabetic from the added fat, and uh, are doing sugar causing inflammatory responses throughout the, the body and actually gaining weight to diabetes or diabetes and obesity combined together. This is horrible. So it is, it is a function of the food system. So let's, let's get down into why these things are good and why they're not so good and how you can approach them in a way that is healthy because sugar, salt, and fats are required for proper human function. It's the form that they're in that can be a problem. And this is what happens when we isolate the oils or the fats in the form of oils or isolate the salt and just add it in superfluous amounts or isolate the sugars and they're not wrapped with their uh, polyphenols and their antioxidants and the fiber and all the things to help us properly metabolize those sugars. That's when they become a problem. It's the isolation process. Okay. So let's start with salt. So um, the daily value of salt is 2,300 milligrams, but the, um, the actual uh, um, uh, American Heart Association suggests that the ideal limit be more like 1500 milligrams per day. That's easy to get just by eating whole foods. So there's no nutritional need to add salt to your food and uh, on a whole, whole food plant-based exclusive uh, diet or plant-based or exclusive diet, meaning eating only plants. So we have to be mindful of the direct links between uh, sodium and hypertension. Obviously, too much sodium can lead to hypertensive states. You got to be mindful of the potassium balance. So getting not only the proper amounts of sodium, but balancing it with the proper amounts of potassium. They go hand in hand. In nature, you generally see that. Things that are generally a little bit more high in sodium also tend to be uh, a good supply of potassium as well. But eating a variety of diet or tracking your food on something like chronometer can help you get that, see where you're at in the um, more uh, ideal balance of potassium and sodium. Now, what we want to do is focus on the major contributor to sodium in the American diets. According to the uh, American Heart Association, 70% of the sodium Americans eat comes from packaged, processed, and prepared foods and from restaurants. Restaurants tend to way oversalt their foods. If you're a restaurateur out there, please don't do this. <laughs> oh my God. I don't use sodium. I don't add salt by and large to any of my foods. And when I do on occasion go out to eat with friends or whatever, the food is so salty to me, it's like, it's not palatable. I mean, it's just like, ugh, I can't even eat it. It's just too much, or I, or I take a couple bites and then I have to drink a half a gallon of water <laughs> just because the sodium's so high. So please reconsider the amount of sodium. It's, it's hurting people and it's not necessary. Good tasting food should taste good without having to dump a, um, a buttload of sodium into your foods. Okay, um, uh, now one consideration to be concerned of, if you're limiting sodium from your diet or excluding it all together in the form of table salt, make sure you're getting sufficient amounts of sodium because it is that important to our body. Now you can go on one of the tracking places and put in your daily food intake and see if you're meeting the minimums, at least getting it up to uh, 1500 milligrams or at least 1000 milligrams per day through the foods that you are consuming. Uh, most of us, that's not the issue. If you eat any packaged or processed foods at all, you're probably getting way over that amount. But if you're not uh, adding iodized salt uh, to yours, then also do watch your iodine. Uh, it's kind of difficult because iodine would generally be found in um, nature, in soil, 
not so much in our factory farming. So factory farming uh, pretty much takes the um, naturally occurring iodine out of the soil, depletes it, and it's not put back into the soil generally unless it's biodynamic farming. And therefore, we may not be getting enough iodine in our diet. For that reason, uh, I actually uh, take an iodine supplement. This is just a single drop. I can put it up there for you. It's uh, this particular brand's called Mary Ruth's. It's nascent iodine. Um, so do consider your iodine because iodine can, um, so iodine uh, attaches to tyrosine, which is an amino acid and forms uh, thyroid hormones. Uh, T3, which is tyrosine, uh, three iodine molecules stuck to it and T4, which is four iodine molecules stuck to it. These are our thyroid hormones and they help us with metabolism. I noticed that as soon as I started taking iodine, because I found my levels were a little bit low, my thyroid started working better because I started dropping body fat pretty quickly. And look, I've been working out daily for <laughs> almost 30 years. And for me to get such a drastic difference, that was something I needed to pay attention to. And I, I think uh, you should con uh, consider taking a look and see if your iodine levels are in healthy range. And if they're not, uh, consider supplementation. Yes, you can get them from sea veggies. My only caution is that sea veggies can be very high in iodine and getting too much iodine can actually be as equally negative. Um, that's why I like controlling my iodine with very specific exact amounts and make sure I'm not getting too much iodine and actually causing a negative effect. Um, iodine has to be really carefully um, monitored, otherwise you can get too much as easily as you can get too little. So having the right amount of iodine per day, either by supplementation or by checking your food on a on chronometer or MyFitnessPal or something like that to, to see where your iodine levels are coming in at. Okay, let's go to oil. All right. So uh, I know uh, people will say, um, oh, the doctors are telling me not to take any oil. But you sell ahi flower oil. I can't take that. <laughs> like, oh God, please stop this. Please stop. Okay, let's talk about why doctors say don't do oil. Oil is just a simple word for liquid fat. 100% of oil calories are fat. So oil is just fat and liquid. And why is it liquid? Because unsaturated fats, meaning not saturated with oxygen molecules, makes it liquid at room temperature. So most plant oils are liquid, and therefore that's what we call oil per se, is a liquid state all by itself. That oil is existing in our foods too. So, all right, here is a walnut, beautiful walnut, healthful walnut, Lots of great studies out there about walnuts. When I take this walnut and squeeze it in my fingers, what you can see, I don't know if you say that, but that is oil on my fingers. That's because there is oil in the nut. You're just not seeing it as liquid oil because it's surrounded by the antioxidants that are in this walnut. So that is oil. And as soon as you chew it in your teeth and your enzymes take it, that oil gets separated. That's right. There's no difference. Now, what is the difference between the oil that you buy on a shelf and the oil that I just squeezed out of this walnut? Well, technically, there's no difference until it starts to oxidize. So oil has an affinity for oxygen. When oil hits air or is exposed to air, it oxidizes. Oxygen is a free radical. So when it attaches to oil, it starts to denature it or change its structure. And that's when the oil can be no bueno, no good. Um, so what we do when we extract the oil out, if we don't uh, initially and then immediately put them with other antioxidants, that oil can oxidize. And especially we can accelerate that oxidation process when we heat oil. Now, when we heat oil, we're, we're making it more volatile. So even more oxygen can attract to it and it oxidize even faster. And that's why we try to get people to stay away from cooked oil, especially the worst of all the worst, which I never do, is deep fried foods. 
you're just saturating it in a heated oil full of oxygen free radicals and then it's just soaking right up into the food and now you've got tons of intentionally intensely oxidized oil that's a really bad thing and that's why fried foods can cause such detrimental effects to the human body okay so why are the studies out there saying olive oil does so much better for you why people actually can improve health why does it actually prevent cancer wait a minute i thought you just said uh, as soon as you pull oils out of their food state that it's antioxidants remember the oil that's in the uh, the uh this uh, this walnut right is surrounded by antioxidants that are in here anti oxidation so it's preventing that oxygen from denaturing and spoiling making rancid that oil that's when that oil becomes a problem the unique thing about olive oil is that when you squeeze it out it takes with it its antioxidant it's called hydroxytyrosyl or ht ht actually protects that and ht itself is a polyphenol that has tremendous health benefits it's been shown uh, to be effective in reducing the um the risks for cancer uh, lots of different things heart attacks uh preventing oxidation of the oil so and, and i'm talking about cold pressed extra virgin olive oil that's most of what's available on the shelf that's what you want cold press meaning no heat and extra virgin meaning it's only pressed once so you're not over pressing that oil and squeezing out stuff to the point where you're actually damaging the oil that's very important cold pressed and extra virgin with that hydroxytyrosyl protecting the oil it tends to not oxidize eventually yes it can oxidize i i wouldn't suggest keeping olive oil uh for a long period of time because eventually it will slowly start to oxidize but if you're going to use it without heating it that's a good thing um and has shown to have health benefits um e even switching out animal oils which are generally saturated fat like lard i don't know if many of you have seen lard but lard is a saturated fat so it's solid at room temperature if you get a piece of uh, meat or a steak you see the the fat on it still fat it's still solid at room temperature that's saturated fat dominantly or even if you buy coconut oil if you put it at uh, room temperature or even slightly cool it's solid because it has a lot more saturated fat even though it does have some polyunsaturates in it too as well um so what's the difference then between essential fats okay essential fats there are only two essential fatty acids and one is ALA found in plants, right? It is the omega-3 version. And when you extract it from the plant, polyunsaturated fats or omegas, omega-3s are antioxidant in themselves. So they tend to not oxidize as quickly. They are have antioxidant properties in the human being. So when you consume them, they act as antioxidants in the body. So this is where it can be different. Obviously, we uh, the ahi flower that we use is immediately put with rosemary, one of the most potent plant antioxidants known. That rosemary actually helps preserve it even better. And then it goes right into a soft gel to protect it against oxygen exposure altogether. So you're not getting that oxidative damage when you're consuming um ahi flour as an omega-3 the other essential fatty acid is la which is an omega-6 so those are the two only two essential fatty acids and they come from plants and they're liquid at room temperature so they are oils these are the good fats the healthy fats that our body requires for survival and overall health and fitness okay so some of the considerations one Oil is 100% calories from fat. So consuming very good sources of uh, polyunsaturated fats. And that's why I liked ahi flour so, so much. This was a clinically proven head-to-head -head test, four times more effective than flax at converting to EPA. Now that means you can use a lot less of it and you're consuming a lot less calories as fat. Um, 
So no oil should mean no isolated oil unless it's olive oil, which has an antioxidant attached to it, or unless it's in a capsule form that is removed from the oxygen and has antioxidants in it. So those are the safer versions of it. What would they say when they want no oils? Because when you remove the oil from the plant, the whole plant, you generally don't get any antioxidants like corn oil, soy oil, um, uh, sunflower oil. All those do not have any antioxidants in it at all, whereas olive oil pulled out of it does. And polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs or omega-3s and 6s, these can be put immediately into a mix with uh, powerful antioxidants, and then directly into a capsule so they don't oxidize either. So those are the safer versions. It's not don't do oil, it's don't do oxidized oils. Let me show you the difference. The same situation happens when with oxidized cholesterol. So our body makes its own cholesterol, but our body has a way of making sure that cholesterol doesn't uh, become sticky and placky and oxidized, right? When you eat external forms of cholesterol, especially if you cook it, like we do with almost all animal products, that causes the oxidation. Remember, I was talking about the oxidation of plant oils with the oxidation of plant, I mean, animal cholesterol does the same thing. What is the difference in that? I'm going to pull up a picture and show you because this is pretty stunning. At the top, these are arteries in the human brain on a healthful plant-based diet or early in life. On the bottom is those who've been eating saturated fat cholesterol from animals. This is literally clogging up the, uh, the arteries in the brain. These are blood vessels in the brain, a picture of them clogged up in the brain from oxidized cholesterol. Now, the oxidized cholesterol almost totally comes from consuming animal products. You see what healthy blood vessels look like on the top in, in section A, all clear and wide open, lots of blood flow, lots of uh, nutrients and and sugar getting to the brain there. And you see the closure, the placking that is happening in the blood vessels and the brains of those who've been eating animal products and oxidized cholesterol. Because as soon as that cholesterol becomes oxidized, then it can stick to surfaces and begin to start forming plaques. It becomes very gooey, very sticky. So this is the big difference between oxidized fats or cholesterol and why they are so detrimental to our health. Okay, so the source of the fat matters, plant versus animal, and I just showed you an indicator of that in the picture above. The type of fat matters, saturated fat, which is mostly found in animal products. Almost all the animal products have saturated fat. Um, except for fish, which has higher amounts of polyunsaturated fats. And, and then plants mostly have a lot of unsaturated fats, uh, although there are avocados and, and coconut that do have uh, saturated fats as well. Uh, we generally don't eat a ton of uh, avocados and um, uh, saturated fats, but Consider this, if you're living in a tropical environment, that you're probably living in a very high climate, which burns up a lot more calories. When the body is heated, it tends to burn more calories. Um, and so saturated fats can actually be somewhat beneficial in the appropriate thing. Now, if you're living up north and eating a bunch of coconuts and avocados every day, maybe, maybe not the best thing, but something to consider. Okay, oxidation matters. Consume a diet high in antioxidants and polyphenols. This can offset some of the uh, detrimental effects of oxidized fats and oils and cholesterols. Do the health benefits outweigh the positive, possible negative benefits? Like the health benefits of avocados are extraordinary. And most of the studies say that eating avocados, even though they're higher in saturated fat, because of all the polyphenols, because of all the vitamins, because of the fiber, because of all the other rich nutrients in there have a, a balancing effect and even a beneficial effect that can overcome these. When you're eating saturated animal fats, no fiber, 
no polyphenols. They have that saturated fat. They have that oxidized fat. They have that oxidized cholesterol. All these negative effects without the positive effects. Whereas plants, if they do have saturated fat or something, they have polyphenols and things to help balance out, help compensate for these uh, potential negatives. And that's how they balance themselves out. They have good and bad, but they equalize themselves out. So there's, there's not a net negative effect unless you're overeating or over consuming. So I, uh, my biggest concern is that the food fear is going to negatively offput, or diets that get so strict, like, oh, you can't do any oils, you can't do any salt, and all those food tastes bland to you, and you can't do any oils, and oils and everything, so I can't eat out, I can't eat over a friend's house, I can't eat anywhere I go because there's salt, oil, and sugar, and everything. And then it gets so restrictive that people say, ah, screw this, I can't do this, and they quit. Well, you don't let perfect be the enemy of good. If you can make small changes, that's better. Your life's going to, your health is going to improve somewhat, even if it's not perfect. Look, and if you're adding good exercise to it, your body can actually handle it. Like every once in a while, I have a, a sweet, real white sugar in it. But because my metabolism is so high, because I work out with so, such intensity, that sugar just gets burned up in me like that. And, and because I, the whole rest of my diet is loaded with polyphenols and antioxidants and fiber, it just doesn't really have as much of a negative effect as somebody who is sedentary and eating these unhealthful types on a regular basis. Remember, it's not what you do some of the time that's the most important. It's what you do most of the time that's going to have the greatest impact on your health. Okay, let's jump into sugar since I just uh, <laughs> admitted my donut fetish. Uh, no, and trust me, look, I'm not a binger. I'm not, I just every once in a while having fun with some friends or family and just indulging, but doing it within reason, having a small amount, like I, I had a, a dessert to just a couple of days ago, but I cut it into quarters and I had a quarter and I ate it real slow. And that way, yeah, it had a little sugar, but it was so small. And I work out with such intensity that sugar just gets burned right off. It's just not a thing. I got to enjoy the food. I got to share with friends, but I burned it right off anyway. And it doesn't have that much effect because I had a small amount. I enjoyed it with intensity. And then um, I, I save the rest for later and I can have a little bit right after a workout when my metabolism high and my demand for sugar is up. And that just goes and stores right into glycogen. Um, you know, even some of the top athletes use uh, sugar dosages um, for uh, athletic performance because their body is so geared to it. It's when that sugar can't be used is when it becomes an issue because Sugar that is not being immediately used and taken up into cells and turned into energy for glycation then can actually glycate in the bloodstream. And that's when it becomes negative and becomes very damaging to the systems. So it's more about how sedentary you are than just a small amount of uh, isolated sugars. Okay, glucose. Now this is from Harvard Medical School. Glucose, a form of sugar is the primary source of energy for every cell in the body. I wanna pull up something in here to show you where glucose comes from. Okay, so this is a picture of a plant and this is how glucose is made. Glucose is the foundational molecule that is added to, to form starch, to form carbohydrates, to form amino acids by the addition of nitrogen, to form cellulose, to form fiber, to form rubber, to form almost everything is made from sugar, from glucose. Almost everything we consume is made. All four macronutrients, carbs, fats, sugar, uh, uh, fiber, and uh, carbs, fats, protein, are all made from glucose. And there's a really important reason for that. And that's because we reverse engineer it. When animals consume plants, either directly from the plants or by eating an animal that's eaten those plants, they can take those fats, carbs, protein, and fiber and break them all 
back down into glucose. And there's a good reason for that. And that's why our whole system, our every cell in the human body and every cell in almost every human li living thing, definitely all the animals, depends on glucose. That's why our body is figured out of the way through our digestive tract, through our microbiome, breaking down uh, fiber, our microbiomes. People say, oh, you can't digest fiber. You can't digest cellulose. We don't need to. We have a symbiotic relationship with our gut bacteria that do that for us. They break it down into another thing called short chain fatty acids. And our body can then break those short chain fatty acids down into glucose too. All fats can be broken down into sugar. All protein can be broken down into sugar. All carbohydrates can be broken down into sugar. That's because our entire body runs on it. As a matter of fact, 50%, I'm going to read this directly, quote from you. Uh, I, uh, let's see where it is. Okay. 50% of all the sugar humans consume is used by our brains. That's right. Besides oxygen and uh, a little bit of fat for foundational purposes, our brain runs almost exclusively on glucose. And when you starve it of glucose, you get brain fog, you get brain dysfunction. Um, so sugar is the foundational molecule for both plants and all animals. This supplies all the energy for all the cells in the body. Sugar is not bad. When you isolate sugar from a plant, you can spike insulin levels, but sugar does not cause diabetes. You know, I, I still can't believe there are people out here that don't understand this. Okay. Uh, so you have the human cell, the uh, human muscle cell. And the human muscle cell, if sugar comes along, insulin brings it over and pulls the sugar into the cell and the body can use it for glycolysis and create ATP, the energy currency for all, all cells in the body. All right. But sugar is the foundational molecule. Now, when there is fat, the body says, oh, that's even more calories, right? 2.25 times more calories than protein or carbohydrates or sugars. Let's put that into the cell, brings it into the muscle cell via insulin, right? And now you've got fat in the cell with two and a half times, almost two and a half times as much calorie content in there. So now you've got a good storage of it. Well, that's great. But if you're not exercising, you're not using that up. And the body keeps having the preference to pull fat in the cell because it's so much more calories, right? It's like dollar bills. If you find a dollar bill or a $5 bill, you're going to take the $5 bill, right? Well, that's what it is. Fat is like a $5 bill. And the body says, ooh, take that one in. That's more money, more calories, more content for making energy. So when it starts doing this, it has a propensity to do this. If you're not active, if you're not using up that, it starts getting packed with fat and starts causing cellular dysfunction. And then the body says, oh, man, we're filled with energy. We can't take anymore. So it shuts down the receptor sites on the outsides of the cell. Now insulin can't die. Now when sugar comes along and says, hey, I'm sugar, man. You can burn me right up and right away. The cell says, uh -uh, we got too much in here. No vacancy. No vacancy. And the insulin can't dock there. Well, it can dock. It just doesn't allow it to open up to allow it. Now the sugar is a problem but it's not sugar that's causing the problem. It's the fat in the cell that's causing the problem. When you exercise, you burn up that fat. That's why exercise improves uh, most uh, of those with uh, original type two diabetes or diet caused type two diabetes. And, and this is why exercise is so important to burn up that excess fat in there so that sugar can get back into the cell where it belongs. So our body is a sugar burning, sugar converting, machine. Our body thrives on sugar. As a matter of fact, one study way long ago actually put uh, diabetics on white table sugar, fruit juice, which is high glycemic, and white rice, all super high glycemic, but also simple carbs so they can burn very quickly. And all of them improved to the point where they were considered non-diabetic at the end of the study. I mean, that's amazing. White sugar curing people of diabetes. Now, I got to be careful not to say that. That was the study. You can read the study yourself. Just Google it. It's pretty funny. 
I have it somewhere. I'll actually post it in the bottom of this if I can find it again. It's an old study, but really, uh, sugar is actually um, is is pro-insulinemic. Fat decreases insulin sensitivity. Sugar increases sen ins uh, insulin sensitivity. Now, diabetes or type two diabetes is insulin insensitivity, meaning it can't cause a response at the cell because the cell's loaded with fat. So the insulin, it can dock there, but it's not sending any cell. The body's not responding. The cell is not responding to it. So this is the big difference. And, um, you know, when I hear people say, oh, you know, I'm diabetic, I can't eat fruit. So here's a great study. Um, associations between fruit intake and risk of diabetes uh, just came out last year, as a matter of fact, and they found that participants eating those with the highest amounts of fruit had a 36% lower odds of having diabetes to begin with. Fruit can actually lower your risk of diabetes. And that's been borne out in study after study after study. They know this. And if you want more information, check out my friends, um, Mastering Diabetes. Um, those two guys are amazing. A PhD in biochemistry, been eating a fruit-based, uh, fruit largely fruit-based diet and managing their diabetes on fruit, on high fruit diet. Awesome stuff. Check them out, uh, Mastering Diabetes. Uh, the book's available on Amazon. You can find out more information uh, on their Facebook page too as well. Great group of guys, great information. So sugar, salt, and fat are not bad until humans start messing with them, right? <laughs> in their natural states, they're, they're fine. And in their natural amounts, they're fine. In their antioxidant phases, or positions, they're fine. They're actually necessary and optimal for human health. It's when we isolate them, put them in processed foods that they can become negative. So please, let's not, let's not perpetuate this fear. No salt, no oil. Let's really take a little bit of time because people who don't know what that means can misinterpret that information. Oh, no salt, no oil, no sugar means no fruit, no celery. Uh, you know, no, no omega threes. And that can be actually detrimental to their overall health and meeting their goals. These overtly, you know, dogmatic restrictions can get people to say, that's too hard. I can't do that. I give up. And rather than, you know, showing them, hey, good, better, best model, you know, that's good. This is better. This is best if you can get there. But allow them to make the stages that will work for them, work for their environment, their workplace, their societal and stuff, and, and applaud those advances until they become more confident in those choices. They see the health benefits of them and can move forward to keep moving forward within that diet. That's what I'm trying to do. Let's let's applaud stepping stones for people and let's not get so pure and dogmatic in our guidelines and regulations to the point where it puts people off and 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 turns people off from the diet when they could be getting better health and better is definitely better. And that's what I want for all of you. I, I hope you've learned some of this. If you have questions, please lay them down. I'm writing a book. Um, your questions, your comments help so I can know what to address, what ideas you're concerned with, um, and and how I can help because that's that's my life's passion. I, I want to help people live the healthiest, most sane <laughs> lifestyle that they can get uh, and move. Let progress be progress. Let's not make absolutes the only option for people uh, and, and applaud them of every step of the way as long as they're moving in a, in a good direction and give them the proper information. It's not an all or nothing equation. Our body is a, an amazing self-healing machine if we just get the frick out of its way sometimes. And if we give it the plants and give it the exercise that our body really wants and needs, then it can do some incredible stuff for us. Keep us healthy, keep us happy, keep us enjoying life and being physically fit so that we can just have fun while we're making money and enjoying life and, and flying around the world and doing the things that we love with our loved ones. Well, that's what it's all about. I hope you enjoyed this. Share it, like it, give it a thumbs up. 
And if you like, please follow us on YouTube at Clean Machine Online. You can see all of my studies, studies on does fruit make you fat, studies on uh, the hydroxytyrosol studies on olive oil, why I think it's such an amazing thing and why it has more health benefits than any detrimental possible effects. And why I obviously uh, take and use and chose ahi flower, the richest source of omega threes and sixes of any plant on the planet. So proud to bring that plant to market um, to give people a truly plant-based healthy source of the richest source of omega threes and sixes of any plant on the planet, higher than flax, chia, hemp, any of it. Thank you for watching. And thank you um, for your time today. I hope you like this. I hope you share. Thanks for having me.